Welcome back, my friends. Thank you for joining us. Well, last time we left Odysseus, he was in Hades. He had made a trip to talk. be able to tell him crucial information about where to go. So, Tiresias was the man Odysseus had voyaged to Hades to talk to. Tiresias was a seer, and even in death, still had the, the guile and the wisdom to retain his ability to see into the future. So, Odysseus asked, How is it I may venture back? To which Tiresias replies, You seek a safe passage home, but this will not be easy, for you have offended the earth shaker, Poseidon. First, your cunning brought down the walls of Troy, which Poseidon himself had set up. In second, you have blinded his son, the Cyclops Polyphemus. You cannot hope to escape the anger of the gods completely. But if you are careful, you and your companions may yet come safely home. But because he knows Odysseus is very prideful, perhaps and maybe in spite, despite his guile and cunning. He says, be warned, if you arouse the wrath of the gods once more, the reward will be death in misery. If you return home at all, it will be late and alone. So Odysseus from then continued to linger in Hades to be able to talk to the other souls and learn what he could, because Odysseus is pretty intelligent, and he knows that many times, if he is respectful, he may learn valuable information from those with whom he parlays. So he sacked Troy. He was a key player in the fall of Troy. And then he got whisk off, whisked off due to the wrath of Poseidon across the seas, bypassing Ithaca, going way, way past Ithaca. Then he went all the way to the Isle of the Lotus Eaters, which appears to be in North Africa, where the fruit, the drugs, the drink, is so potent it makes you forget all meaning and purpose in your life. So after he had the wisdom to avoid eating that and gathered his men, he sailed north to an island west of Sicily. And here he tried to learn what he could from the Cyclops and perhaps gain his his help. The Cyclops was only interested in eating him and his men. Boom, boom, boom. And in fact, the Cyclops did eat half of his dozen men. So after 
outwitting the Cyclops by hiding under the sheep. Once they got him drunk and stabbed his eye out, they stole the sheep and sailed. the island of the god of the wind, Aeolus. And after making it all the way within sight of Ithaca, the bag of wind that Aeolus had given Odysseus was opened up by his men when he was sleeping and had his guard down. So this wind blew them all the way west yet again to Circe's enchanted isle, whence his men were turned into buffoons and boars to be her minions. So Odysseus actually found the messenger of the gods, of the gods, Hermes, 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 who told him to draw his sword and be on the offense when meeting Circe, the goddess of enchantment, so as not to fall under her spell. Because he swooned her, she directed him towards the south, the south, the south, the south, into Hades, where he learned his fate from Tiresias. So, now you are caught up. So now we've come to the song of the sirens. From Hades, Odysseus returned to Aea to thank, to thank Circe, and to bury the body of Elpenor, the man, the youngest of his men who had fallen from the roof due to his inexperience, just as he had Welcome, brave men, she greeted them. You have faced death undaunted. For most it is enough to meet death once in a lifetime. You are fated to do so twice. But now forget murky Hades. Eat, drink, and in the morning you shall set sail. Odysseus and his men were glad to be back in the world of light and laughter, and spent that evening celebrating. And the next day, Circe bade them farewell with some last words of advice for Odysseus. You must sail past the island of the Sirens. They bewitch passing sailors with their beautiful singing. If you sail too close to them, you will fall under their spell, and that will be the end of you. For though they seem from the sea like lovely maidens, once they have lured you ashore, they will turn into hag-like birds of prey. Their island is littered with the bones of men they have trapped and devoured. Once safely past the sirens, 
more dangers await you. You must choose between two terrible routes. The first is overshadowed by great rocks, known as the Wanderers, because they do not stay still, but clash together and seem to take pleasure in smashing ships into pieces. Only Jason and the Argonauts ever passed that way safely, and that was with the help of the goddess Hera. In the other route is bounded on one side by cliffs so high you cannot see the sky above them. In the halfway up these cliffs is a dingy cave in which the monster Skyla lives. Her cry will not frighten you. It is no more worrying than a pup's yelp. But if, if you see her, you will not forget her. She has twelve dangling feet and six long necks, each topped with a grisly head, each with three rows of evil teeth. And from her cave she fishes in the morning, in the roaring sea below, scooping out dolphins and sharks and other beasts. She feasts greedily with all her heads, from the deck of any passing ship, glutting herself on death. So I guess I was wrong, this wasn't the sirens, this was actually the Sela or Sky. Now, on the other side of the cliff, it's lower. A fig tree grows upon it, but do not steer beneath its shady boughs, for there the charbdis lurks. Three times a day, she sucks the dark waters down, then jets them back in a hideous fountain. If you are caught by her, there is no hope for you. Better to steer by the side of six men than to all perish in the maw of the Charptus. Could we not simply slay these monsters? asked Odysseus. Don't be a fool, replied Circe. These are deathless creatures beyond your strength and understanding. And Odysseus set sail once again, worrying about how to best deal with the perils. So as they neared the island of the Sirens, he told his men of the dangers facing them. We must not listen to the Sirens' songs, he said, or we shall be lost. You must block your ears with a soft wax so that you cannot hear. But Odysseus himself could not pass by the fabled island without hearing the song that was so beautiful it could lure men to their deaths. Again heeding Circe's words, he told his men to lash him to the mast and made them promise not to release him, even if he commanded them to. drew near to the island, the wind dropped, all was calm and hushed, and into that hush dripped the honeyed notes of the siren's song. Odysseus begged and pleaded with his crew to set him free so that he could follow the majestic song to its source. But they would not, and only bound him tighter to the mast as the song of the sirens grew. Ever. 
the Siren's Isle. Odysseus chose to take the route between the Skyla and the Charptis, knowing that no friendly god would speed his ship past the dreadful waters. Soon he could see ahead the crash and the spray of the waters. It was a frightening sight in the roaring of the sea beneath the Skyla's cave. Charptis sucked down the waters and spewed them out again, drained the courage from the rowers who let their oars drop idle into the water. Odysseus urged them, Be brave, this is no worse than in the Cyclops' cave. Row, row for your lives. Where Charptis gulped and vomited the salt waters, the sea swirled in a deadly whirlpool, which would drag any ship to the bottom. There was no choice but to hug the cliffs. And suddenly above, Skyla's six fearsome heads swung down, and she seized six of the strongest and best of the crews in her jaws. Odysseus could do nothing as the monster lifted the screaming men into the air, calling his name with heart-rending cries. So as they sailed past, Odysseus and the remaining crew could hear above the turmoil of the sea a terrible lapping, crunching, as Scylla savored. the sirens singing their sweet, sweet song as Odysseus listens with a face of melancholy of, uh, of actual delight, serene delight. The sirens serenaded him. Luckily he was tied tight. And you see the two men on the mast tightening the ropes. But little would he have known going on with this guy back here, but, you know, perhaps it's another part of the story that was left out. Okay, so we're now on the chapter of the Council of the Gods. After watching Powerless while the monster Skyla devoured six of his men, Odysseus was thankful to arrive at the island of Sicily, where he anchored in a beautiful, curving bay. Now on that island were the herds of the sun god, Hyperion, seven herds of cows and seven flocks of sheep. Each herd and flock numbered exactly fifty animals. None ever died, and none We must leave these animals alone, said Odysseus, for if we meddle with them, trouble will surely follow. And his men agreed. Of course, as Tiresias in Hades mentioned, he warned him not to toy and meddle with the gods or their sheep. So I wonder if this, in this tale, the sheep was a metaphor for a for the citizens of a particular country. But a strong south wind kept them cooped up on the island for a whole month, at the end of which their supplies were definitely exhausted. Odysseus fretted and worried. He begged great Zeus to guide him, and the god granted him that deep sleep new strength and new ideas. Not too dissimilar for what, from what my mere mortal talents are attempting to do to you right now. And while 
Odysseus slept, his men lay awake with hunger gnawing at their stomachs. At last Eurylochus said, Starvation is the worst of all deaths. Let us feast on the sun god's cattle. When we get back to Ithaca, we can offer sacrifice to Hyperion and earn his forgiveness. So the men herded up the sun god's cattle with their long curly horns and slaughtered them. When Odysseus awoke and smelled the roasting meat, his heart almost failed. For he knew as Tiresias had foretold that a fearful end awaited those who offended one of the gods. Indeed, at that moment, Hyperion was standing before Zeus, demanding justice. Odysseus's crew have slaughtered my cattle, which were my joy. Every day, as I took my path across the sky, I looked down on them with pride and pleasure. Now they are gone. Unless these men pay with their lives, I will go and live in Hades and shine among the dead. So when the wind calmed and the men were able to once more hoist the white sail to take to the sea, their fate was already sealed. Zeus raised a black, violent storm and blasted the ship with searing thunderbolts. The ship shivered to pieces, and Eurylochus and all the others were drowned. Only Odysseus survived, clinging to the wreckage. For nine days he drifted helpless on the salt sea, until at last he came to the island of Ogygia, home of Calypso, a goddess with many strange powers. Calypso, like Circe, fell in love with Odysseus, who had traveled so far across the world and had proved his courage and ingenuity so many times. You deserve to be a god, she said. Marry me and I will make you immortal. But Odysseus would not marry her, for he knew in his heart that he must return to Penelope and Telemachus. Yet how could he? He had no ship and no crew to man on. And besides, Calypso was, had so bewitched him that he could not leave the island. So Odysseus spent seven long lonely years, sitting on the clifftops, staring out to sea, and weeping at his fate. Now all this time Poseidon the earth shaker kept Odysseus in the glare of his terrible anger. In the glare of his terrible anger. In Ithaca, Penelope grieved for her absent husband. Suitors from many lands came to Odysseus' palace, hoping to win her hand. Odysseus is surely dead, they would say as they lounged at his table eating his food and drinking his wine. Then they would call for music and dancing and revel into the night. Drinking and dancing and reveling into the night. Odysseus' son Telemachus was now a young man handsome and strong, but there was little he could do against the arrogance of the suitors. As for Penelope, she could only fight for time. I will make my choice among you, she told them. When I have finished this tapestry showing my husband Odysseus's great feats against the Trojans, this much I owe to his memory. Each day she worked hard at the tapestry, but each night, while the drunken suitors caroused and sang, she unpicked the work she had done, so the tapestry was never finished. Now it happened that Poseidon was absent from Mount Olympus, having gone to Ethiopia to receive a great sacrifice of bulls and rams. 
As the other gods gathered together in the palace of Zeus, Athena, the wisest of them all, spoke. Often it is true these foolish mortals bring their troubles on themselves while blaming the gods for all their misfortunes. But my heart is wrung for Odysseus, who has been kept so long from his home and family. Even now he is prisoner of Calypso, daughter of Atlas, who knows the depths of the sea, and on his shoulders supports the great pillars that keep the earth and sky apart. Tell me, Zeus, why do you not take pity on him? It is not I, but Poseidon, who cannot forgive Odysseus for blinding his son Polyphemus. Then responded Athena, as Poseidon is not here, let us see if we can help this unfortunate man. Let us send bright Hermes, our messenger, to instruct Calypso to let Odysseus go. I shall proceed to Ithaca to rouse the spirit of young Telemachus, Odysseus's son, who has had to endure so many insults from his mother's suitors. And with that, Athena strapped on her sandals of gleaming gold which carried her like the wind over land and water and sped down to Ithaca, where she took the form of Mentes, an old friend of Odysseus. When she arrived at Odysseus's palace, she found the suitors roistering in the courtyard, playing games, swilling wine, and making jokes jokes at the expense of Telemachus. He was pale and tense, but when he saw Mentes, he rose and courteously beckoned him to sit down. What news of your father, noble Odysseus? asked the guest. No news, answered Telemachus. His bones are bleached in the sun on some far island or rotting at the bottom of the sea. Do you think if these louts thought there was any chance of his return, they would be lolling here? No, they would be running up to their ships as fast as their legs could carry them. If so great a man as Odysseus has died, the world would know of it. Tell these suitors they are not welcome here, and if they choose to stay, they must suffer the consequences. Then take the ship with me, and we will sail in search of news. Telemachus did as Mentes advised, and they sailed the next day for Sparta to ask King Menelaus for news of Odysseus. And all the time, Athena in the guise of Mentes was at the side of young Telemachus, shaping the boy into a man and strengthening his resolve to find his father and defy the suitors. Alright, well I think we're just going to go ahead and leave it here for today. And pick it up next time. With Odysseus being cast ashore. Thanks for dropping by. And thank you for all your support.